Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machida. And I just wanted to put together a short video to cap off our series on the reception of the so-called Apocrypha in Lutheranism, both Old and New Testament canons. We went through a lot of material. We've spanned the centuries from Martin Luther all the way to the present day. And we saw how things had changed both in the Old and the New Testament, Luther thought. So I thought it'd be great to maybe just give a couple of my own observations, some curiosities and some thoughts on that process. Also, there is a portion I didn't discuss from uh, Proust, who was a Lutheran theologian, who gives his own reasons why the New Testament uh, can and change like it did. And what I'd like to do is maybe give some thoughts on his reasons as well. So... A lot to cover, so fasten your seatbelts, folks, because the Apocrypha Apocalypse is beginning right now. Okay, so when I first started this series, I decided to expand what we're looking at outside of the Old Testament canon, because Apocrypha Apocalypse channels really focused on Old Testament canonical issues. But in Lutheranism, there was also a change in the New Testament as well. And I thought it'd be instructive to look at both changes that occurred within Lutheran thought and compare and contrast one with the other. Um, so uh, we did a little bit more in this series than we normally do when we pick a topic or look at the reception within a particular group. As far as recap, the original justification for the protestant canon came from martin luther himself ultimately it comes into his first edition of the german bible and he does something interesting he makes several innovations in his bible one innovation is that he gathers all the deuterocanonical books from the old testament that used to be intermixed with the protocanonical books without distinction he gathers them into an appendix and gives a warning on the appendix that these are apocrypha. They're good and useful to be read, but they're not to be held equal to the rest of scripture or scripture. In doing so, he denied the canonicity of these books, but he nevertheless thought that they were useful and good to be read. He also believed that they were biblical. They do belong in the Bible. If he didn't, he wouldn't have put in his German translation. And also, we know from the colophon at the end of the section that they are authentic members of the Old Testament. So they're non-canonical biblical books of the Old Testament. And so they're good, useful to be read, not inspired, not canonical. That was his position as opposed to the historic position that they are canonical and they um, are inspired by God and therefore can confirm doctrine. So his justification there is very important because that marks a change. In fact, we saw how he flip-flopped even personally on these books. But there's also the New Testament. New Testament, Martin Luther segregates several New Testament books from the canon. These are books of James, Jude, Revelation, the so-called Apocrypha of the New Testament or Deuterocanon of the New Testament. Unlike the Old Testament, Luther doesn't place them in an appendix. He doesn't give a warning or anything like that. Instead, in the table of contents, what he does is he does not number them. Also, it is segregated by adding an extra line or two so that this makes up a distinct group of names as opposed to the canonical books. Now, eventually, Luther himself begins to retreat from this position in the New Testament. But nevertheless, you can see where there is major ch canonical changes in the Lutheran Bible with Martin Luther. Uh, this, we trace the history through Lutheran thought through the centuries until today, where in the Old Testament, Lutherans commonly don't even know about the so-called Apocrypha, or if they do, um, their value is really sub-biblical. It, they're not really considered biblical books, much less authentic members of the Old Testament. Now, I don't want to paint with a broad brush because 
this isn't uniform throughout Lutherans. There may be Lutherans who are wholeheartedly anchored in their past and would robustly want the Lutheran Bible to reflect Luther's original German translation. But there are a lot of Lutherans that, quite frankly, are a bit embarrassed about the whole thing and are fine with Bibles that don't have these books. In the New Testament, however, Lutherans, by and large, uh, will believe that those books that Luther would not accept as canonical are fully canonical, capable of confirming doctrine. And we're going to see some quotes to that effect. So the whole distinction in the New Testament has been virtually erased within Lutheran thought. Although, of course, there is a recognition of the past and that changes were made, but they tend to be dismissed or downplayed within Lutheran writings, by and large. Not all. There are counterexamples to this where there are modern Lutherans who uh, actually want the distinction be made. But by and large, it's, it's not. So how did we get from point A to point B today? And that's what those videos that we put out basically chronicle. I tried to do my best. Of course, I can't include everything. I can't read everything. But I relied on some doctrinal dissertations by Lutherans and other sources as well. So I want to give some observations of my own, just looking at the overall argumentation and so on. I noticed that when it came to the New Testament canon, historically Lutheran theologians tended to present both positive and negative evidence from the early church in regards to the New Testament. However, when it came to the Old Testament, their presentations were wholly negative. You never saw positive arguments why these books should be included in the Bible, why they're part of the Old Testament, nothing like that. It was wholly negative. So immediately you do have a kind of canonical duplicity going on. Now, someone would probably say and that Lutherans really thought that there was a universal rejection of the so-called Apocrypha in the early church, where in the New Testament, you only have sporadic doubts. But the fact of the matter is, if you watch this channel, you've seen our treatment in history, and we focused on figures who supposedly reject these books. What you find is that's not the case. In fact, there's a lot more going on here, and there's a lot of positive evidence for these books being inspired scripture capable of confirming doctrine. So with that presentation, one that's wholly negative when it comes to the Old Testament and one that's mixed in the New Testament, it's not surprising that the New Testament would fare better historically than the Old within Lutheran thought. Another uh, observation I'd like to make is when it came to looking at the early church, when it was the New Testament, I found it interesting that the doubts were limited in time to only the earliest doubts. For Chemnitz, it was like the first generation or immediately afterwards, and some of those theologians followed Chemnitz in that regard. But later doubts didn't matter, even though some doubts were still lingering into the Middle Ages, right, especially about authorship. When it came to the so-called Apocrypha of the Old Testament, however, we noticed that uh, some theologians would list everything, throw in the kitchen sink in terms of negative evidence. In fact, uh, one theologian, I don't remember who it was, it may be Gerhard, but it could be wrong, actually list uh, the fathers and writers who supposedly rejected uh, the so-called Apocrypha, and he actually lists everything in the early church all the way up through the Middle Ages, like all the way up to the time of Luther. So it really is everything in the kitchen sink as well when it came to negative evidence. For New Testament, however, they were just concerned about the earliest doubts, interesting enough. And, um, and we, I, we, I've already talked about in this series uh, Chemnitz's remark about Earlier doubts cannot be overturned by the present church, and that that's exactly what happens within Lutheranism. The present church, the present uh, Lutheran uh, synods and so on, 
actually did overturn those doubts and merely see them as some sort of academic exercise that really has no impact on how we approach scripture, something very different from Luther and Chemnitz. We also made some observations in regards to the reception within Judaism and how Lutheran theologians understood that. I noticed how several theologians would refer to the Old Testament books as never being received or rejected by the Jewish church. And I found that very interesting that they saw uh, Judaism as somehow a monolithic body, kind of like Christian body, but Jewish, apparently. Um, But when it comes to uh, Jewish evidence, and this is important because it's another way of sidestepping patristic data, is to claim that the Jews never accepted these books and rejected these books, and that somehow this has a bearing on Christian belief. And I noticed several theologians, what they do is they jump from Romans 3, 2, where Paul talks about the advantage of being a Jew as being entrusted with the oracles of God and leapfrogging from the time of Paul to Josephus and then jumping centuries later to rabbinic Judaism when this is already developed. And apparently these Lutheran theologians were familiar with the comeback, which is the Jews formed their own canon, and it's a post-Christian canon. Probably uh, this early on, it may have even been the so-called Council of Jamnia theory. Was it still a live issue that rabbis gathered around 100 AD to decide which books are canonical and which ones aren't? And that's when the rejection supposedly occurred. This theory, by the way, has been debunked since the 1950s. It's no longer a live issue. It's kind of a mischaracterization of Jamnia. But nevertheless, back then, they would probably think of this Jewish school as actually like a Jewish council, like a Christian council. But the problem is it's 100 AD, long after the resurrection, the ascension, and so on and so forth. So what do you do with that? Well, we noted a couple of theologians who qualifies this, and the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God in perpetuity. That is, forever they are in charge, they are custodians of the Old Testament, even after Christ had come, even after the apostles had preached the gospel to the world, even after the temples destroyed in AD 70, Even after Judaism rejects Jesus, they're still the custodians of the Old Testament. And uh, and again, if you watch this channel, you realize the early church fathers rejected that view as being ridiculous. But nevertheless, uh, I thought that was an interesting feature in this series. One last thing I want to point out before we look at uh, a couple of quotes is the multiplication of criteria within Lutheran thought. When Luther originally rejected these books, the Old Testament as Apocrypha and the New Testament, he downgrades them to Apocrypha, but segregates them. His rationale was based on two criteria. One is Christ preached, whether he hears his own doctrine being preached within a particular book. And the other is uh, the early church. Okay, although he never really explicitly goes into the early church evidence except at uh, Lipsic Disputation, as far as I know. Um, But those were the two major reasons why he rejected these books and did what he did. At least that's the the formal, official reason. So did he get to Chemnitz, who comes right after Martin Luther and has to deal with Trent. Chemnitz abandons the first criteria altogether. In fact, I didn't find any theologians and I didn't find anything in these thesis to suggest that the Christ priest principle was continued on within Lutheran thought. It was completely abandoned. What was left with Chemnitz was only the early church. And like I said, how early is the early church? For the New Testament, it's the earliest church. For the Old Testament, it's pretty much into the fifth century onwards, right, apparently. Which I, I think is, uh, I think Lutheran theologians realized 
that's a thin branch to sit on. And so what you find is theologians begin to propose various criteria by which you could discern whether book or books are apocryphal or books or books are canonical. And this criteria tends to grow as time goes on. And to me, it seems that these are really ad hoc or post hoc attempts, I should say, to justify a position already held. Because if you look at the individual lines, the various criterion within these lists, you notice that they seem to be arbitrary. In fact, we pointed that out in the series where, for example, uh, the Jutero canon is apocrypha because it's not known to be written by a prophet. Well, the problem is there's several proto-canonical books that Lutherans accept as canonical in the Old Testament that we're not sure who the authors are, and we're pretty sure that some of them, their authors, were not formally known as prophets. So if that line of uh, in, within the criteria actually rejects proto-canonical books, then it seems as if that's not a legitimate criteria, right? But they're all kind of like that. And it seems like it's just a blanket attempt to try to come up with reasons why these particular books were accepted and other ones were not accepted. And to me, that's the first signal that you really don't know why, right? As far as rational uh, evidence is concerned. We, you don't know what the evidence is for the foundations on your position on the canon. And we saw that with several Lutheran theologians. Um, I want to quickly quote uh, this passage, which I find very interesting. This is from John Francis Budeus. And he writes in 1727 the following. In regard to the epistle which is attributed to James, there was dispute as to the authority and author, and it is well known what the thinking and opinion of our own blessed Luther was regarding it. For being aroused by the heat of the controversy against the Catholics he plainly denied that this epistle had come from an apostle, he even called it a straw epistle in the preface of the first edition of his German Bible, and on this account he gave occasion to his adversaries to hurl various calumnies against him, from which among others Henry Myers has vindicated him and also Richard Simon. But that this letter was written by James the Apostle has been placed beyond all doubt today. Now Proust here thinks that he is giving a backhanded compliment to Luther while dismissing him at the same time. He says that Luther originally rejected or downplayed the authority of James, the Epistle of James, because its authority was disputed, its authorship was disputed. And interesting enough, Budia says that this degradation of James was due to the controversy against the Catholics. I thought this was a very interesting admission. What was the motive for Luther changing the New Testament canon to downgrade James? Budia says it was the controversy with Catholics. And this is true. The reason being, the first time you hear Luther disparage the epistle of James is in his work of the resolutions of the Lipsic Disputation. Remember, Lipsic Disputation was where he was forced by Johann Eck to deny the canonicity of the Old Testament Deutero canon. He said that it has weight with the faithful, but it won't prevail against the obstinate, and it can't be admitted into debate. The resolutions to that debate Luther begins to downgrade or denigrate the epistle of James. And it gets worse from there. As more and more Catholics are arguing against Luther, his opinion of James gets lower and lower. He calls the epistle straw famously. Uh, talks about throwing Jimmy in the fire famously. All this is admitted by Deus, but notice he says the impetus for it is arguments against the Catholics. But then he says, but Modern scholars have vindicated Luther in regards to doubts as far as whether or not James should belong. And then he says that, but that this letter was written by James the Apostle has been placed beyond all doubt today. So currently, whatever doubts Luther had initially, although those doubts have been confirmed by scholars, 
nevertheless, we don't care. It just seems like everybody concedes it's from James. I don't know if that's true, by the way, but but you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> if this is true for Luther, for the New Testament, that he's willing to denigrate and dismiss canonical epistle of James because of controversies with Catholics, and this has been overcome and dismissed by uh, Lutherans, and they no longer hold that original view of Luther, the question is, what about the Old Testament Apocrypha? Was that not born out of controversy with the Catholics, just like James? After all, the resolutions to the Lipsic Disputation is about the Lipsic Disputation, where he rejects the Old Testament Apocrypha. And this, apparently, Budeus doesn't comment on. But then again, I'm relying on him through a secondary source. I wish I could actually uh, get an English translation of his works to see if he ever uh, does talk about this but anyway kind of canonical duplicity when it comes to the new testament well luther had doubts because um and he dismisses them you know he doesn't number them amongst the new testament canonical books because of controversies with catholics but now you know scholarship has changed and we don't really care and now james is canonical well what about the old testament apocrypha that was born from controversy with catholics why hasn't that changed especially since in my books on the Deuterocanon, why Catholic Bibles are bigger, case for the Deuterocanon, uh, I show modern Protestant scholarship actually gives some really good grounds to believe that these books should be considered inspired scripture and indeed all the stuff you see on this channel as well. So anyway, I want to continue on with a quote from Proust. This article from Proust, he, he actually considers why, you know, what's the underlying sources for the changes within the New Testament canon. So here's what Proust has to say. To explain why the thinking of the Orthodox Lutherans gradually changed, regarding the value of the Antiligamina is not easy to discover from their writings. But some reasons do appear. First, there would seem to be the intrinsic value of the books themselves. Even Luther and Chemnitz use Hebrews, Revelation, and 2 Peter constantly. Second, the history of the Church ever since 397 favored the inclusion of these books in the canon. Such a tradition is hard to break. Third, the quotations from Gerhard, Menzer, Seckendorf, and Budius all indicate that the attacks of the Romanists against Luther's position on James in particular and the early Lutheran position on the Antiligamina in general were unpleasant and embarrassing to the Lutherans. Budius is at pains to point out that Richard Simon, a Catholic, had tried to vindicate Luther on James. Okay, so here's the quote from Proust, a uh, very interesting enumeration of reasons that he thinks uh, change the New Testament canon. So his remarks are solely for the New Testament canon. By the way, his comments about Budeus at the end, you're, if you're wondering if that has to do with the paragraph we just read, yes, that's exactly what it is. In fact, I got that quotation from uh, Proust's work. So let's go through it. And I'd just like to make some comments and think about the Old Testament canon when he comes up with these reasons why the so-called Apocrypha of the New Testament was elevated to full canonical status by later Lutherans. So he begins by stating that it's not easy to discover from the writings why these disputed books, the Antilegomena, uh, why they were resuscitated in the New Testament, but he does say there are some reasons that do appear. First reason, he says, is that there seems to be intrinsic value within the books themselves, and he says that Luther and Chemnitz uh, also used Hebrews, Revelation, and Second Peter constantly. That's true, okay? Uh, they did quote these books in the New Testament Apocrypha, and so they did see some intrinsic value. However, when it comes to the Old Testament, we find the same thing occurring. Uh, Luther continues to use the Deuterocanon of the Old Testament, in his writings. Now, I grant you, they're probably not with the same frequency as the New Testament Apocrypha, so-called, but nevertheless, uh, 
it's the Old Testament. There's a lot of books in the Old Testament. Uh, you would expect that New Testament quotations would necessarily outnumber old ones, especially books that are generally wisdom literature or historical books like Maccabees, Sirach, and Wisdom, and so on. Okay? So it continues to be used. In fact, if you remember, we said that the Book of Concord quotes and references Tobit and Second Maccabees, and it does so in a positive way. So even the Book of Concord uses this. So is this not also an indication of the intrinsic value of the so-called Apocrypha? Okay, so the intrinsic value of the New Testament seems to be more of a push value than the old. Okay. Second, the history of the church ever since 397 favored the inclusion of these books in the canon. Such a tradition is hard to break. Now, the reference to 397 is talking about the North African Code, which would include uh, Hippo Regis, Council 393, Carthage 3, which is 397, and then 419 is Carthage 17, which the, the code is kind of put together as a collection. So he's talking about the North African councils, and he's saying that they favored the inclusion of James and 2nd, 3rd John, 2nd Peter, Jude, Revelation, as canonical books. And since the 4th century to today, there's this tradition that's kind of hard to break. Okay, so that's an, another impetus for considering these books fully canonical, even though Luther and Chemnitz didn't. But the problem is that the North African councils not only defined the canon of the New Testament, but as you well know, these very same councils defined the canon of the Old Testament, which include the deuterocanonical books that Luther rejected. So if the New Testament has a tradition of canonicity that was hard to break because of its antiquity. Why can't the tradition of the Old Testament canon defined by the very same councils, why was that so easy to break? Now, dare I say, it seems to me that it's because they contradicted Luther's teachings. And so they couldn't be considered canonical regardless of the tradition that continued. His third reason is the quotations from Gerhard, Metzger, Seckendorf, and Budeus all indicate, so he says all these theologians indicate that the attack of the Romanist against Luther's position on James in particular and the early Lutheran position on the Antilegomena in general was unpleasant and embarrassing to the Lutherans. And it says Budeus is at pains to point out that Richard Simon, a Catholic, had tried to vindicate Luther on James. Well, what about Catholics also going after Luther on the Old Testament canon? So why was it that Lutherans were uh, found it unpleasant and embarrassing to hold Luther's position in the New Testament, but not unpleasant and embarrassing to hold his views on the Old Testament. Well, in a way, they were unpleasant and embarrassed, and that's why they wanted to get rid of the Old Testament books. And like I mentioned earlier, I think that's because once Trent comes and the Reformed camp stakes out their claim that these books are not canonical and should essentially be pushed out of the Bible, plus you have the British Foreign, Foreign and Bible Society with their campaign against Protestant Bibles with the so-called Apocrypha in it. I think since they felt abandoned by fellow Protestants, they got embarrassed. And so in the New Testament, they acquiesced to give full canonical status to the books Luther uh, rejected, but they also fully rejected the books that Luther wished to be retained in the Bible and thought were authentic members of the Old Testament. So those are my thoughts on the series. I would like to reflect more on it. There's a lot of data to crunch, even while I'm making these videos and researching them. I'm sure there's a lot of data I haven't considered. And so who knows, maybe a future video, I'll redo this and come up with some more refined 
critiques of Lutheran thought and the reception of these books. But nevertheless, I think it's a fascinating subject, and it's one that I think a lot of Protestants are unaware of. And that's why we're here, folks, to unveil the truth about the so-called Apocrypha, hence the Apocrypha Apocalypse. So thank you all for watching. By the way, if you haven't done it and you enjoy this channel, please sub. We need uh, subscribers. Tell your friends about it. Um, also, thumbs up. Hit, uh, hit the bell so you're notified when new videos come out. I try to put out a new video weekly, although sometimes I can't make that. I, I'd rather do quality videos rather than quantity videos. But anyway, I appreciate your support on Patreon, as does William Albrecht. So until next time, I'm Gary Machuda. Have a great day.